welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Luma Willis, and I'm your host for this week's parasha, Balak, for 2022. And in this week's parasha, we're going to see what's called the error of Balaam. We're going to see just how prevalent this error was back in the days of our forefathers in the wilderness, how prevalent it was in the first century during the days of the great falling away, and we'll also see how prevalent it is in the Ephraimite movement today. We're going to see those who allow themselves to fall into this very simple error will probably not make it through the tribulation. All that's coming up. In the last parasha, Hukat, we saw that even though our forefathers were grumblers and complainers, a bunch of whiners, Yahweh still helped them to conquer. So even though our forefathers were not faithful, he was still faithful. Well, so in Bamidbar, or Numbers chapter 21, Yahweh helped our forefathers to destroy the king of Arad. Then he helped our ancestors defeat Sihon, king of the Amorites. And then after that, he also helped us defeat King Og, also king of the Amorites. Then in chapter 22, we see that the king of Moab, Balak, or the Annihilator, the son of Zippor, saw everything that our forefathers had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of our forefathers because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of our ancestors. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this company is going to lick up everything around us like an ox licks up the grass of the field. If you've ever seen cows, that's exactly what they do. They wrap their tongues around the grass and they just lick it up and consume it. So King Balak sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor. And Strong tells us his name probably means something like not one of the people. So then the annihilator said to not one of the people, look, a uh, people, Israel, our forefathers, has come up from Egypt. And see, they cover the face of the earth. And they're settling in next to me. Therefore, please come at once and curse this people for me because they're too much for me. Perhaps I should be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed and he whom you curse is cursed. So, from our point of view, Balaam is effectively an independent minister. He's not truly part of our organized nation. He's not attempting to build first the kingdom of Elohim. He just uses the good spiritual gifts that Elohim gives him to make his own independent money. Now, does anyone know any independent ministers or ministries like that in the Ephraimite movement? They're not trying to build upon a single foundation of apostles and prophets according to a five-fold ministry protocol. They're just trying to make money for themselves. And then, yeah, I don't know how many these guys have talked with over the years, but they always say, what's wrong with that? The worker's worthy of his hire. <laughs> Your brothers, listen, wait 30 or 40 years, and we're going to see what's wrong with that. But I would think if we value our lives, we're going to make changes first such that what we're preaching and teaching and walking and talking looks like the book of Acts and not like something else. Verse 7. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hands. And that's the key point. People say, I don't understand what this passage means. They've forgotten. Okay, the elders departed with the diviner's fee in their hand because they know they're going to pay, right? So they bring it right up front. And they came to Balaam and paid him the diviner's fee up front, because that's how you do it, right? I mean, you know, if you're a diviner or a fortune teller or any kind of information-based business or service, you have to ask for the fee up front. Because if you do the divination and he doesn't like what you said, why is he going to pay you? I mean, even if you even if you even if he likes what you tell him, why is he going to pay? Because why buy the cow when the milk is free, right? Okay, so you have to charge him the fee for divination up front. And that's why they came with the fee for divination in their hand. So they came to Balaam, paid him the fee, and told him what Annihilator, the king of Moab, wanted. Okay, now, after they'd already paid their fees, Balaam said, Okay, lodge here tonight. Okay, El- 
Elohim's probably going to speak to me in a dream, and I'll bring back word to you. But whatever Yahweh speaks, that's what I'm going to say to you. Okay, because you already paid me the fee, so I'm just going to tell you whatever he says. It's just a straight information deal. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then Elohim came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to Elohim, Annihilator, the king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people is come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. So come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I should be able to overpower them and drive them out. Elohim said to not one of his people, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now, let's notice also what Elohim didn't say here. Elohim didn't say anything about the need to bring more money. Elohim didn't say, What? That's all they paid you? (laughs) I'm insulted. If they bring you more money, then you can go with them. But only if they bring you more money. He didn't say that. So the independent minister rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for Yahweh has refused to give me permission to go with you. Okay, now, so far, so good. No sin, no foul up to this point. It's a very simple transaction. They paid the fee for divination. Elohim said no. Done deal. It's all done. Okay, but, verse 14, what happened? The princes of Moab rose and went back to the annihilator and said, you know, even though he's not one of the organized nation, he refuses to come with us. So what does the annihilator do? Verse 15, he again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than before, probably with more divination money in their hands. And they came to Balaam with more fees for divination in their hands mo money and they said to him thus says the annihilator please let nothing hinder you from coming to me i will certainly honor you greatly i will give you whatever you want i'll do whatever you say to me but therefore please come and curse this people for me so that me and my people don't die well bailey he said no you don't understand how this works. Okay, hold up. How this works is, okay, this is information service. You give me the money up front, then I consult Elohim, and I tell you what he says. Okay, that's it. Okay, I'm not a false prophet. I'm not making things up. I'm not saying anything Elohim doesn't say. Okay, you're paying me a fee. I'm just telling you what Elohim says. Okay, that's all I'm doing. I'm passing information. Know any messianic ministries like that? Verse 18. And even if King Annihilator were to give me his whole palace full of silver and gold, and gemstones, precious pearls, stocks and bonds, 401k plans, cushy pillows, potato chips, whatever, I cannot go beyond the word of Yahweh my Elohim to do less or to do more. Okay, and he probably believes what he's saying. And at least in his own mind, he probably believes he's being a faithful mercenary seer and a faithful prophet of Yahweh. He's just using the good gifts that Yahweh gave him to make his own money. What's wrong with that? Okay. Well, now we're going to see what's wrong with that. We're going to see he's going to make a big mistake. He's going to make the decision to let money play a part in his decision-making process. And that's because Balaam is double-minded. That means he's making decisions based on more than just Elohim and his word alone. In this case, he's making decisions based on Elohim's word and money. So in other words, he's making decisions based on Elohim and mammon. That's what's wrong with that. So, But he thinks he's cool. How many of us know messianic ministers? They're just using the good spiritual gifts Elohim gave them to make money but they think they're cool. In verse 19, he says, well, you know, if you put it that way, that's 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 quite quite a diviner's fee you've brought there in your hand. Well, now therefore, well, please stay here tonight and and let me ask Yahweh again because you're giving me a new diviner's fee and that's what I do. I consult Yahweh. So you're asking me again, so let me consult again. You know, because that's a mighty fine diviner's fee you brought there in your hand. 
you know, I mean, Yahweh, he didn't say anything about uh, you need to bring more money the last time I asked him, but, you know, I make my living based on diviner's fees, and I sure don't want to turn your fee away. You know, so if you stay here again tonight, let me ask him again. You know, he already said not to go with you because he's already blessed the people. But let me ask him again. We'll get a second opinion. Maybe, maybe Yahweh change his mind. What, what do you think? Verse 20. Elohim is thinking, hey, you turkey, you know what? Did I, did I tell you that I would change my mind if the annihilator sent more money? Okay, I didn't say anything about more money. Okay, but I... Uh, here i can see this this mercenary prophet this for-profit prophet this mercenary seer here he's not thinking about me he's not thinking about what i want he's not thinking about the kingdom i'm trying to establish here on the earth he's just using the good spiritual gifts i made him to make his own independent minister money all right so what am i going to do here okay how are we going to deal with this man so elohim comes to Balaam at night and he says to him okay look here's how it is Okay, if the men have come to call you and you want to go, okay, rise and go with them. But if you go, only the word that I say to you, that you shall speak. Okay, nothing else. Okay, you're not going to seek what I want. You're not dedicated to me. You're not trying to help my people, Israel. <laughs> sure, I'm going to let you wear yourself out on this thing. I'm going to use you for my purposes, just like the King Nebuchadnezzar going to end badly for you, just like it ends badly for all the independent mercenary ministers, for all the independent for-profit prophets, because Yeshua says, he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Well, so what happens? Okay, Belium makes his choice. He rises in the morning, saddles his donkey, and he went with the princes of Moab. Didn't have to. Okay, Elohim's anger was aroused because Balaam chose to go. And a lot of people, again, they find this passage very confusing. And sometimes people say, I, I don't get it. Why did Elohim get angry? I mean, that, you know, he said it was okay to go. What's the problem? Elohim told Balaam, if the men have come to call you, rise and go with them. And that's what he did. So why is Elohim getting upset? Let's think about it again from Elohim's point of view. It's not enough to, to use his gifts for our own purposes. He wants us to use our gifts for his purposes. Elohim wants us to be one of his people. And what's your alternative? Not one of his people? Okay. And Elohim wants us to want what he wants. That's what it means when we love Yahweh our Elohim with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. It means if we love him, we should want to know what he wants us to do. That's not what Balaam is doing. And that's not what most independent mercenary ministries are doing. They're not building Yeshua's kingdom. Okay, So if we want something other than what Yahweh wants for us, he doesn't like it so much. Because he created us to serve him. We are his slaves. We have a job to perform. The thing is, Yahweh is such a gentleman. He's never going to make us do his will. But he's always going to note the difference whether or not we do his will. And if we choose, we want to be disobedient, he's going to turn us over to the desires of our heart. He's going to give us over unto our reprobate, unclean desires. It's a simple relationship, really. If we love Yahweh, and we ask him, and then we do what he says, we do what he wants, everything's going to go very well for us. It's like Shema or bust. But Balaam didn't want that. Balaam wanted to be independent. He wasn't seeking what Elohim wanted. He wasn't trying to be part of Elohim's unified people. Okay? He didn't love Elohim. That's the problem. Or if he did love Elohim, why didn't he do what Elohim wanted? And nothing more, nothing less. But that's the real question. That's a question for us today. We can see very easily Balaam was for hire. If there was more money in the offing, Balaam was going to ask Yao if he could take it. And Balaam thought he was doing good. He probably thought he was receiving the blessings 
for being a faithful for-profit prophet and a faithful mercenary seer of Yahweh. Anyone know any messianic ministries like this? Not seeking Elohim's heart, not attempting to preach according to the book of Acts, not helping people conform to Yeshua's example, just teaching people to adore Yeshua and not pattern their worship after Yeshua, not seeking Elohim's heart and thinking they're doing good. Well, then we have various sundry and silly episodes. If we had more time, we'd talk about how Balaam basically tries to please Balak to justify his diviner's fee. Okay. Problem is, he's not trying to please Yahweh Elohim because he's not doing what Elohim said. Elohim already told him not to curse the people because Israel was blessed. It has nothing to do with money. But don't we have a lot of Messianic ministers, Ephraimites, Orthodox rabbis saying a whole lot of things Elohim, his word never says? Why is that? Are we doing these things to please Elohim? Are we doing these things to justify our salaries? Well, double-mindedness isn't just a problem in the Torah, because we'll see the same kind of double-mindedness in our Haftarah prophetic portion. So let's come to Melachim Bet, or 2 Kings chapter 5. And here we meet Naaman the Aramean. Now, he was a mighty man of valor, working for the wrong team. He was on the Assyrian side of things. And he was a leper. Now, in Hebrew, leprosy is called tzarat, or saras if you have an Ashkenazi speech defect. Now, it's Strong's Hebrew Concordance, H or OT 8679. In scripture, tzarat refers to any kind of infection or skin problem that they don't really know what causes it. Now, some kinds, there's kind of an angry, red, infected hair situation or not. Uh, but generally just some kind of angry red inflammation to leprosy. Now, the backstory is the Assyrians would go out on raids and attack our ancestors in the land. Now, a young Israelite girl was carried off into Assyria and taken into slavery in the service of Naaman the Aramean, the leprous warrior. But now notice something special here. Now, even though she's a slave, now notice the Israelite girl still has the humility and the love for all people to tell her evil captor master how to get healed. And let's remember that as the Sabbatean Francus slowly bring the great tribulation down upon us. Okay. We as Israelites, we don't fight fire with fire. Okay. Our duty is to love all people regardless of what they're doing to us. Think about the Beatitudes. If we love only those who love us, what reward do we have? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Okay, and this is where some of our brethren go off the rails as they forget to love all mankind. They think, oh no, we are just the genetic Jews, so that's all. You no, know, that's not it. He's not about our flesh. He's about our spirits. Okay, we're called to love everyone, even while they're still sinners. Even while they're still sinning against us, we're still called to love them. So we fight fire with the waters of the Spirit, at least wherever we can, trusting and praying that Elohim is going to make everything work out all right. Okay, so fast forward. The Israelite girl tells Naaman that if he will go see the prophet Elisha, he can be healed. So he does. He goes there to see Elisha, and Elisha serves him without any thought of pay whatsoever. Nothing, no money is involved. And he says, nonetheless, let Naaman come to him only so that he will know that there is a prophet in Israel, meaning that he will know that there's an Elohim in Israel. And that's exactly what happens. Elisha serves Naaman without any thought of any pay of any kind. What's he doing? He's heaping coals of fire on Naaman's head. He's heaping coals of fire on someone who took an Israelite girl captive and is holding her as a slave. Well, he tells Naaman to wash seven times in the Yarden, and he does, and he's clean. He's amazed. His skin is soft and supple like that of a child. And it worked. In verse 15, he says, Indeed, now I know that there is no Elohim in all the earth except in Israel. So his strategy worked. 
Naaman says, now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. Please take a gift from my hand. I should give you something. But Elisha refuses money. He refuses Naaman's gifts, even though Naaman urges, presses him, offers repeatedly. But what's the point? The point is, Elisha isn't even interested in something Yahweh didn't give him. He's not interested in mammon. He's not interested in taking anything Yahweh Elohim doesn't say to take. Oh, oh, but what happened? His servant Gehazi sure is. Okay? So the leprosy clings to Gehazi because Gehazi was double-minded, because Gehazi didn't glorify Elohim. Gehazi didn't say, you know what? Look at this wonderful miracle that's been wrought. We have an Assyrian who's in service to the king of Assyria, and now he knows there is no Elohim in all the earth except in Israel. What a wonderful moment. And to mess with that, to mess with the glorification of Elohim. Hmm. Ouch. That's double-minded. So from here, let's go to the book of Micah. Let's drop quickly to chapter 1 and verse 1. We're going to see that Micah was a prophet to both the houses of Israel, both to Samaria, meaning Ephraim, and also to Jerusalem, meaning the southern kingdom of Judah. And let's jump to chapter 6. And here we see Elohim pleading with Israel because he has a complaint. What's his complaint? Well, his complaint basically is that his people are double-minded, just like Balaam. And I wish we had time to go through the whole book systematically. But basically, Elohim says his people are not doing things his way. Rather, they're doing things their own way, basically because there's more money in it for them. His people are double-minded. In verse 5, Yahweh says, O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from the Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of Yahweh. What was it? What was it that Balak counseled? And what was it that Balaam answered him? Balak counseled paying a prophet to pervert Yahweh's will as if that was even possible. But the problem is, Balaam went along with it, just in case there might be something in it for him. Okay. Is that how Elohim wants a prophet to act? He's going to give a prophet good spiritual gifts, and the prophet's going to act like that? You know, we could also remember how it was when Elohim first called us out of Egypt, okay, how he gave us the firstborn priesthood. Now, in those early days, we didn't have commandments for animal sacrifices. We covered this earlier in the series. At that time, all Elohim wanted was that we would obey his voice and be diligent to do everything that he said, including all of his written commandments, because those also are just things that the Spirit has said to do. We're responsible for all that. It was only after the sin of the golden calf, when we failed, that's when Yahweh gave us the animal sacrificial system. Because we'd already proven that we're too rebellious and we don't care. We're just plain too stupid to hear and obey his voice and decide to be diligent about doing it. And we've talked about this all through the series. That's why Yahweh, and Brother Judah, that's why Yahweh gave us the animal sacrificial system in the first place, was as a trainer until we should learn how to discipline ourselves to do what he wanted in the first place, which is to hear his voice and do everything he says. And that's what he's wanted all along. That's why he gave us the temple system was as a step because what he really wants, he's really trying to restore is that relationship that was lost and broken in the Garden of Eden. But we severed our trust with him. We, we behaved incorrectly. Well, now we have a situation where our Orthodox brethren are getting ready to put together a third temple dedicated to their anti-Mashiach. And we're going to see this happen. Now, this will not be the millennial temple of Ezekiel chapters 44 through 46. It's a different temple than that. Okay, the next temple we're going to see is going to be the anti-Yeshua or the anti-Mashiach temple of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay. 
Let's ask ourselves a question. Okay, Yahweh's speaking to both houses in Micah. Okay, what are we going to be teaching? What are our Orthodox brethren going to be teaching in that coming temple? Are they going to be teaching the whole world to hear and obey Yahweh's voice and to be diligent about doing everything that he said to do, including all of his written commandments? Or are they going to teach the world to submit to the Talmud because those are the commandments of men? Which one are they going to try? Are they going to try and teach people to bring an offering to them, just like Balak promised to honor Balaam, if he would corrupt Yahweh's word and teach something other than what Yahweh said to do? Okay, let's hear the word of Yahweh, verse 6. Yahweh says, With what shall I come before Yahweh and bow myself before the high Elohim? Shall I come before him to honor him with burnt offerings, with the soft, juicy flesh of calves only a year old, with veal? Will Yahweh be pleased with thousands of rams, or with 10,000 rivers of oil? Oh, hey, I know. If I transgress, yeah, I just bring in my firstborn son in an offering for my transgression. Yeah, I can give the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul. Because Yahweh doesn't want obedience to his voice. He just wants blood, right? He just wants us to give the rabbis our tithes and gifts and offerings, right? Yahweh forbid, brothers. Yahweh's always wanted us to hear and obey his voice, including all his written commands. That's what he wants. Okay, he wants us to be a blessing like that for the whole world. Why are we setting up to do something other than that? Okay. Yahweh wants that we learn to pay attention, hear and obey his voice, and pay attention to him with each breath, with each, to be thankful for each breath, and to let his will guide our will, so that we can be guided away from sin and into his righteousness by the gift of his Spirit. He's shown us, brothers, what is good. What does Yahweh our Elohim require of us? but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our Elohim, taking care to listen to what he says and to obey his voice in each moment. What does he want but for us to restore the original trust-obedience relationship that existed in the garden that we severed by our disobedience because we didn't want to hear and obey his voice because we had other things that were more important to us the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, and our pride. We saw the fruit. We thought it looked good. We thought it would taste good. We thought it would make us wise, boost our ego. Well, sometime when Elohim gives us time, we hope to have time to talk about the sins of Omri and the wicked system of Omri that still exists and has been adopted both in Judah and in Ephraim talk about this some other time, but briefly, our ancestor, our Ephraimite king Omri, came up with a totally different system to replace Yahweh's inheritance laws. Now, these laws of Omri, are, they are the foundation of what today we call the fee simple estate system, that modern day banking and the mortgage industry, they're all based on that. And Yahweh says, that's not right, that's not what I told you to do. Hear the rod. Because his punishment is coming. Because he doesn't like us altering his words. He doesn't like us replacing his system with a system of our own. Because, brothers, we haven't made things any better. We've made things far worse. Because, oh, and why do we do this? Yeah, he says, because there's no money for us in this system. So once again, we've exchanged the inheritance of Yahweh for a man-made system because there's no money. And just like Balaam, we're going around thinking everything is just fine, even though we're using the good spiritual gifts he gives us to do something other than to establish his son's kingdom. And we think it's going to go well for us. And so now we come to our Brit Hadashah, or our renewed covenant portion. Let's go to the book of Yehuda or Jude. But we're going to see it's the same problem as in the wilderness. It just takes on a different aspect. 
Here we have Israelites, and in this case we have believers in Yeshua, we have Nazarene Jews, but they're wanting to worship Yeshua their own way. They don't want to do what Yeshua said to do. They want to worship Yeshua their own way. And isn't that just like our ancestors? But the problem is, in the first century, our forefathers being disobedient looked like the great falling away, and they didn't recover. In fact, we are that recovery beginning now, beginning in 1996. But as we explain in the Nazarene Israel study, outside the land of Israel, where the Torah wasn't understood, the Torahless Christian variation of the faith, the broad, easy road version of the faith, began to flourish and grew much more rapidly than the Torah-obedient Nazarene Israelite faith. So then three centuries later, the Roman variation of the faith stamped out all the other variations of the faith, including the original first century Israelite sect of the Nazarenes. Now here, Yehuda or Jude, is warning everyone, in verse 3, that there is an specific faith that needs to be contended for and adhered to. There was an specific Israelite sect of the Nazarenes that the people need to adhere to that doctrine. They need to walk according to that halakha. But of course, our ancestors, we don't want to do it Elohim's way. We want to walk our own way. Okay, and we can just see the whole great falling away developing, reading the epistles. And Jude was considered to be a, uh, well, Yeshua's brothers, none of them believed in him while he was alive, but they saw him after he had been resurrected. So Jude was one of the brothers who believed. It was believed he was a traveling uh, apostle or traveling missionary out in the dispersion outside the land of Israel. Uh, where the Gentile nations held the Torah to be worthless. They held it in contempt. So again, we can see how the original first century Israelite sect of the Nazarenes would fall by the wayside as is eclipsed by the Christian Torahless variations of the faith. And Jude is complaining about all these things. Once again, just like our forefathers in the wilderness, they're seeking after the blessings rather than seeking the blessor. They're seeking the gifts rather than the giver. Well, as we explain in Revelation and the End Times, we also it's called Revelation Simplified on YouTube, now is the time for everyone in the body of Mashiach, both Judah and Ephraim, to begin coming together in the right order in these last days. The right order is known. We need to be ordering ourselves according to, to the commanded order, so that we unify on a single foundation of apostles and prophets according to the fivefold protocol. And this is especially important in that we're facing two very important, uh, you might call, phase markers in the progression. We'll talk about this more in the Revelation study. Father willing, we'll get an opportunity to do Revelation in the end times, part two. But the thing is, the Ephraimite movement, it's generally acknowledged, began around 1996, 1998, 2000. Now notice, that's 2,000 years after Yeshua's birth in 4 BCE. Now, just as it says in Hosea, after two days he shall revive us, and in the third day he shall raise us up so that we live before him in his sight. Okay, now, if 2,000 years after Yeshua's birth, is when we began to see the restoration of the house of Ephraim, 1996, 1998, 2000. Okay. What do we expect to see 2,000 years from the start of Yeshua's ministry? That's coming up in 2026. There's another major time point, 2,000 years after Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection. That's coming up around mm, 2029, 2030, depending on how you count. Now, that's also about the time they expect to bring Agenda 2030 to full fruition and full power. That's a huge time of change. We believe it will also be a huge time of growth for the original Nazarene faith because he says, after two days he shall revive us, and in the third day he shall lift us up so that we live before him in his sight. We believe it's going to be a huge time of growth at these time points. 
And it makes sense because as our people begin to experience pain, finally we begin to listen. When things are going too good, we're not listening to Yahweh. It's only when things go badly, when we get rebuked, that's when we finally start to wake up. So let's get prayed up and let's get ready because Yahweh's true restoration is in process. Brothers and sisters, there's some important things we need to be doing for him right now to get ready for these important prophetic time points at 2026 and at 2030. Now, we don't know the exact dates. We just know the sequences. You can read all about those sequences in Revelation in the End Times or Revelation Simplified. Again, Father willing, please pray. He'll give us time to do Revelation in the End Times Part 2, even Part 3. There's some really great stuff I'd love to, to show you all. But the very first thing is we need to do the things Elohim commands us. Everyone wants all the revelations. Everyone wants all knowledge of prophecy. But so every, We all want the gifts. How many of us want to serve him the way he wants to be served? But regarding Balak and Belaam, as we read this epistle from Jude, as you read it at home, read it from the eyes of the Nazarene Jew or the Nazarene Israelite who wrote it. Okay, he's telling us we need to contend earnestly for the original faith. He's talking about a fight. Okay, well, what kind of a spiritual army are we for him if we can't even fight and contend for the original faith? Okay, and then we read the list of complaints that Jews levels against our ancestors in these assemblies that are out in the dispersion as the great falling away begins. And this is in the first century. Now, verse 8, he says there's dreamers in the body, or maybe it's some sons of Joseph. There's dreamers in the body, and they're dreaming that their salvation allows them to defile the flesh, to eat unclean meats, to do things the Torah says not to do, to do things the Torah says will defile us. So they ignore those kinds of things, just like Christianity. Okay, well, there's others, they say that we should reject authority. We can even speak evil of dignitaries. Okay, anyone know any, anyone in the Ephraimite movement like that? Okay. Well, then he tells us that the true role of the biblical prophet in the first century, it's already given way to the for-profit prophet. Now we have for-profit prophets with a profit motive inside the body of Mashiach. This is in the first century. Now, just like Balaam, okay, they're using the good spiritual gifts for their own benefit and their own gain rather than using the giftings to build the body of Mashiach worldwide, to bring things together in the right order. Anyone see, just like our ancestors in the wilderness, they're seeking the gifts of Yahweh, not the giver. Okay, so he's, and today we have, as we go through the Revelation study. Hopefully we'll get more time to talk about this in the future. Uh, we have inside the body of Mashiach. We have Belaam, we have Ahab, we have Jezebel, we have the Nicolaitan spirit, we have the Laodicean spirit. We have all kinds of demons inside the body of Mashiach. Okay, we're not immune to discipline and punishment. Okay, verse 11, Yehuda says, Woe to them. For they have gone in the way of Cain or Cain, and they've run greedily in the air of Balaam, the for prophet prophet. And they've perished in Korah's rebellion, because our forefathers were just plain rebellious, just like us. Verse 16, he says that there's grumblers and complainers, just like our forefathers in the wilderness. And the reason we're complaining, he says, is we're not seeking what Elohim wants. Oh no, we're seeking our own desires. We want what we want. And Yehuda calls this walking after our own lusts. Brothers, sisters, verse 24 tells us that if we will but dedicate ourselves to his cause and repent and walk according to his spirit, he is able to keep us from stumbling. He can present us faultless, spotless, without blemish 
before the presence of his glory at the day of the judgment, as we stand before that awesome great white throne, he can bring us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And all we have to do is to make a commitment to want only what he wants. We have to make a commitment to renounce double-mindedness, which is wanting what we want in addition to what he wants for us. And it's the only way to please him, which is the only way to survive the Great Tribulation. Let's pray for it, brothers, sisters. Shabbat Shalom.